today, as we look at Hagar, uh, the title of this message is Seeing the One Who Sees Me. But the subtitle I've, I've called it is The Covenant and the Mess. And uh, life is complex and messy. Uh, I, I was thinking back over this month, uh, just the month of leading up to uh, to giving this this talk. And um, I thought, oh, maybe I could share as an example all the things that have been going on in, in my life just in this one month up to sharing this message. And uh, when I started thinking about it, it was so messy that I thought that is going to take far too long and I can't even share it. But our lives are complex and um, not just in our relationships, but in our hearts, in our minds, in our, in our money, in our needs, uh, all, everything is, is, is messy. And we have a God who is with us and for us in the mess. And so um, I want to just pray as, as I begin. Lord, we thank you uh, for your word. And I want to pray that you would open our hearts to the scriptures today. Holy Spirit, would you lead me? Would you give me every word from your heart? And would you speak to us, Lord? We thank you for your loving voice for us. We want to hear you today. So have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. So the backdrop to this story of Hagar, which starts all the way in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the backdrop, so to speak, we've got to set the stage uh, for this account of Hagar. And the backdrop really is the covenant. Uh, so what in, on earth is a covenant? What are we talking about when we say covenant in the Bible? Well, it's a love binding promise of God's saving power and faithfulness in two way relationship with us. God gives himself in love, inviting us to give ourselves to him in love and become his chosen people. That's what we mean when we say covenant. So now we've got the backdrop, uh, we can start with the, with the account. We're going to start with this covenant with Abraham and Sarai, who starts off as Abraham and Sarai, uh, who were very old, and Sarai could not have any children. But here's what God promises. We're in Genesis chapter 15, verse 4 to 6. God promises a son who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. God took him outside, this is Abram, and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. We could say a lot about that, but we're going to fix our eyes on Hagar in this story. So that was the covenant. Now let's turn and look at the mess. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, and she had been waiting for God's promise of that covenant to be fulfilled for years and years. The Lord has kept me from having children, she says to Abram. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build my family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. 
so she fled from her. What a mess. We don't have time tonight to talk about uh, Abram or Sarai or their marriage. But there was the mess. And that's how it began. I want to just make the point before we go on with this account that God does not avoid the mess. The mess of Abraham and Sarai and Hagar is in scripture. God does not write the mess out of his story. If you look at other religions, uh, their spiritual books have spiritual superheroes who never seem to do anything wrong and can always hear clearly from God and never get exasperated or, or try and do the wrong thing instead of letting God do it. But that is not what scripture is like. It is a real account of real people. And God is a God of grace who meets with real people and works in real people and works through real messy people. God, just the fact that this account of Hagar is in the Bible tells us God does not avoid the mess. Our mighty, holy, loving God does not miss it or hide from it, and he is not overwhelmed by it. Um, I, I do to, do a lot of uh, listening and praying with women, and um, it, it never ceases to amaze me sometimes how people have suffered something terrible and and then what happens when they do try and share it and i've had a number of women uh who've shared with me that when something terrible and 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 just really painful has happened in their lives they've gone to their one of their parents and tried to share it with them often the mom they've tried to share the mess uh with their parents and uh so often that the, the moms will say, I can't listen to this. It's just too much for them. I can't listen to this. Or they'll say things like, we don't have that in this family. Some I've, I've heard some women whose parent has literally walked away when they're trying to ch ch share the terrible thing that's happened. They just, the parent just says, no, nope, and walks away. And then I've had some women who say that their parent actually put their hands over their ears and would not listen. You know, sometimes that is how we picture God. And that is not who he is. He does not put his hands over his ears or walk away or say, we don't have that in this holy family. That is not who God is. He is also not a God who can't look on sad things. The Bible describes God as a depender of the oppressed, the ones who sees those who are really suffering uh, the most. God is not a God who puts his in, fingers in his ears and whistles a happy tune. That is not who God is. He does not avoid the mess. And our mighty, loving, holy God does not miss it or hide from it. And unlike us and our parents, God is not overwhelmed by the mess. And I want to just say here as a side note, I am so sorry if believers can't cope with the mess. Some of the situations um, that go on, some of the emotions that go on, if you share that in a church, you may find that believers can't cope with the mess. And I'm so sorry if that is your experience. Maybe you felt like no one prayed or you were not cared for. Maybe you feel like no one checked up on you when you shared something very deep. Um, and maybe you have a messy story from the past or the present and believers have showed that they actually just don't want to listen. They can't cope with it. Maybe they seem to show that they don't even think Jesus can cleanse your life or forgive you or, or heal or change the situation and that there's no point in praying. I am really sorry if that's your experience. I think all of us have had that experience. I know I have several times. All of us have had that experience at some point. And I would please ask you to know that the way that believers have responded is not true to who God is. Please know that God is not ignoring your mess. 
in your relationships and in your suffering, God is not repulsed. God is not embarrassed. God is not too overwhelmed for you or your mess. It is not too much for him. And, and, and as a side note to that, all of us need to be very careful how we represent Jesus. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to know what to say in these difficult situations. It doesn't mean that we have to even know how to pray. It just means that we need to show compassion. We need to show uh, love and listen. And we can always pray, Jesus, help. We don't have to know the details. So God is not a God who avoids the mess. And we know that just because this story is here. And then we, we let's hear just about what happens next, because this this history in Scripture is about Yahweh, our God, and Abraham and Sarai and the covenant. But the account follows Hagar. Remember, Sarah has Sarai has mistreated Hagar. She's very, very upset with her and she's mistreated Hagar. And here's what happens next. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. So Hagar had run away into the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said to Hagar, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. So this account follows Hagar even into the desert. She's running away from Sarai. I can't imagine how she was feeling, but she was desperate. She was really desperate. She went to a place that was pretty dangerous. It was not safe to be in the desert alone as a young woman, uh, especially not a pregnant young woman. It was a harsh place, but that's where, where she ran from. So in all of that desperation in this dangerous place, the Lord himself meets with her and speaks to her and, and says her name. Can you imagine? She's in this situation where literally nobody sees her. Nobody really cares about her. And she's just being used uh, to have this baby. And when God comes, he speaks her name, Hagar. And he asks her a question. Where have you come? Where are you going? It's not, he's not asking for her geographical location. He's talking about her heart. God speaks your name even when no one else sees you. Hagar is not unseen by God in this story. When nobody else sees her or understands her, Hagar is not unseen by God. And I want you to know today that God knows your name and God sees you in the mess. Not just what you're doing, not just what you say, or not just what your roles or responsibilities are. God sees you the real you, all of you. God sees you in all the complex situations and, and the struggles of your life. God sees you. And then uh, let's read the next part of the story here. Verse nine, then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. God gives this incredible promise of blessing and descendants to a young servant. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord. This is Hagar speaking. She gives this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So God meets you in the mess and embraces you in the desert places. God speaks to Hagar personally 
and, and asks her to go back to Sarah. Most of the time, we kind of want Jesus to take us out of the mess and give us a completely new situation or a new relationship. But that often isn't actually what happens. And God sends her back into the mess. But he goes with her and he promises uh, blessings and descendants beyond what she can count. He's called El Roy. And Hagar gets to speak this name, El Roy. Let's just take a few minutes to stop and, and imagine this. El Roy means the God who sees, the God who sees me. And it's Genesis 16, verse 13. I want to just read it in some different versions because it, it just takes a while to sink in. That the God of the whole universe, the mighty Lord, would see me. As I read this, think about it. Do you believe it? Do you believe that he sees you? She gave this name. This is the NIV, New International Version. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. The ESV says, you are a God of seeing. For well, she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. NLT says, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? New King James Version says, you are the God who sees. For well, she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Don't know about you, but I've been in a lot of messes in my life. And they don't always get fixed straight away. But in the toughest, toughest times, if I know that God sees me there, it changes everything. It changes everything. He sees me and he sees my heart. His name is El Roy. And, his, and that's not just for Hagar, that's for you. It's his character and his heart. It's who he is. And then let's just look closely at the name she asks. Uh, she's to give uh, her son the name Ishmael, which means God hears. Genesis 16, verse 11, the ESV says, you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. NIV, for the Lord has heard your misery. The NLT says, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. New King James Version says, because the Lord has heard your affliction. It's, I find it hard to even read those verses. That is who God is. He's El Roy, the God who sees. And he tells her to call her baby Ishmael because he's the God who hears. He, what does he hear? He hears our affliction. He hears our misery. He hears our distress. He is the God who sees and hears you, however deep and complex your suffering is and whatever mess you are in. And this truth uh, really breaks a lot of the lies of the enemy that go round and round in our hearts and minds. And all of us, in, in when we're in really tough places, in really tough relationships and really complex messes, we can really feel very easily like God does not see us and God does not hear us. And the enemy loves to come with that lie to us. But this truth breaks the lies. Some of those lies you, you're familiar with. God does not, maybe the lie is God does not see the struggle or hear the cries. Or God does not know the real me. Or God does not really love me. God does not care or he would change all of this. God can't deal with this. Or even I'm too messed up for God to come near. Those are lies from the enemy. And all of us feel that at times. But this truth of El Roy is, is the God who sees and the God who hears. And it breaks those lies of the enemy. He's the father of compassion. And he sees your heart response to the mess. God is not just a God who sees situations. He's not just seeing what you say and what you do 
and what other people do to you. He's the God who sees our heart response in the mess. That's why he goes with Hagar all the way into the desert and talks with her there and asks her questions and calls her by name. He sees my heart. And uh, it's interesting to think for a minute, how did Hagar feel? We don't, we're not told that, but we see what she does. She treat, she, 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 uh, treats Sarah, Sarai with contempt and she runs to the desert. So we get a pretty big clue of how she's feeling. She's wounded. This, this hurts. She's questioning, why is this happening to me? She's probably overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. I can't take any more of, of Sarai. Uh, she's probably angry. This is not right. Maybe there's shame. I'm a problem, an inconvenience or an embarrassment. And if there's anybody who ever had the right to say that, it was Hagar. Maybe she felt crushed and not liked or wanted or understood. She probably felt a sense of shock. How did I get to this point? This was not supposed to happen. Probably disappointed. I expected different things for my life. She must have felt used. They only want what I can do for them. They don't care about me. She must have felt helpless. I can't change this. This is a hopeless situation. That's why she ran to the desert. And there must have been a sense of shame. I have less value. I'm less than others uh, because of this mess. All of us feel all those emotions at, at multiple points. <laughs> and some of them all at once. <laughs> those are very normal reactions to trauma, trauma, those are very normal reactions to messy relationships uh, and, and difficult ways that people treat us. And I want to just say that past struggles or pain can increase or complicate all of those feelings. So we need to understand that, that God sees us, the Father of compassion sees our heart response to all the messy places. He sees all of that in you. And then the enemy can use those feelings to oppress us and, and he adds his distortions and his destructive whispers to them. So we need to be on guard in all of those kind of emotions. But I want to encourage you today that you can bring all those emotions to Jesus. It might help sometimes to write them down. Often we don't even know what we're feeling. Sometimes it helps to write them down, but however you do it, make sure you bring them to Jesus because he sees your heart response to the mess and he wants to meet you. Ask him to, to meet you in each of those emotions with his comfort and his love. Ask him to speak truth into each of those emotions. So I can say that God understands me deeply doesn't just see he doesn't just know he understands me deeply and he sits attentively with me in the mess and as as christians we know that jesus has stepped down into our mess and lived in this messy world and so how much more can can jesus understand me deeply and and sit with me in the mess i just want to read a couple of scriptures we could go on all day with this but i want to read thir psalm 31 verse 7 I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. We have a God who sees the affliction, but he also knows our heart response. He sees the anguish of my soul. And then Isaiah 49, verse 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you, says the Lord. Can you hear that again? God's compassion is greater than a mother to the baby that she has born. God says, though she may forget, I will not forget you. And then he says, see, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. And when we hear that about him engraving me on his hands, it means that I'm always, I'm always there. He can't, for, he can't forget me, but it, it reminds me of the cross. 
It reminds me of what Jesus did when the nails were put through his hands for me. And then the last part of that verse says, your walls are ever before me. What does that mean? Well, he's talking about his people and the walls around Jerusalem. That was their defenses and their protection. And God's eyes are on them all the time. He's looking for where they're vulnerable. He's looking for where the walls are broken and where the enemies might get in. And God says, I'm always watching. My eyes are on you. I'm looking for where you might be wounded. I'm looking for where you might be attacked. I'm looking and seeing your vulnerable places. It's a beautiful scripture. It's one of my favorite in, in, in the Bible, actually. Psalm 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. All of us are brokenhearted at point, And God promises he is close to us. When we are crushed in spirit, and it will it always will happen to us at some point, he, he comes to save us. Maybe not from the situation, but he's, he's coming with this saving love to us. So we can pray when we read scriptures like this, and we could go on all day, obviously. When we read scriptures like this, um, and there are many of them in the Bible, it's hard sometimes to receive them because of all those feelings and because of some of those lies that the enemy adds and his whispers. And so when we read scriptures like that, we want to pray, Jesus, speak your truth and your love to my heart today in, and get specific, get specific uh, of what's going on in your heart. What's going, what, what are some of the messes in your life? And then be alert to the battle. Recognize where the enemy is trying to stir things up and, or, or oppress you with emotions or lie. And, and we want to pray, Lord Jesus, you fight for me and protect my mind, my heart. We want to pray, Lord, break lies and break half truths and break distortions in the name of Jesus. Because when we're reading scripture, or when we're not reading scripture, <laughs> the enemy loves to come and give us distortions about who we are or who God is. He loves to, to mess up the image like a distorted photograph of who God really is. So we want to pray, and I encourage you to pray that out loud because you're praying against the enemy as well as praying to God. And the enemy's lame. He can't hear you unless you pray loud. So pray for Jesus to protect your mind and pr always pray in the name of Jesus because that is your authority. But then let's let's go back and look again. Let's see what see what happened. So God met with Hagar and, and embraced her in the wilderness, but he also gave her some instructions. He told her to go back into the mess. I don't think she probably liked that. We're always thinking, no, Jesus, I can't do it. I can't go back into the mess. But he asked her to go back. but And he also promised blessing. And God does that for us. He often sends us into the mess, uh, but he, he promises his blessing for us and, and his inheritance for us, despite the mess. And then God tells her, don't show contempt to Sarah anymore. He asks her to submit to her miss to her 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 boss uh, and her her mistress. He asks Hagar to submit. I think some some of that maybe was that if she goes back, she's got she's she's very vulnerable. She's pregnant, and if she goes back, she's got people to care for her. If she goes back um, and she submits, then maybe Sarah will be nicer to her. Uh, but I think there's also something deep that we can see here that that Hagar's heart needs to be right with God. God doesn't want anything to come between us and him. So that anger and that contempt, God, God says, I don't, I don't want that. He wants to be able to be near to us. He doesn't want us to be far from him in our hearts. And so Hagar's heart needs to be right with God, however much Sarai is wrong. And that's really hard, isn't it? We would kind of like it if, in the, because God knows in those messy places, it's very painful and we're ground down and people treat us badly sometimes. 
it's very complex uh, or it's very um, just confusing and our responses can be all over the place. And God knows that, and he has deep compassion and grace for us in that. But he also wants our hearts to be right with him in situations, however wrong the, the other people are in those messy places. So God often does not take us out of the messy places as we would like, but Jesus wants to guide us and strengthen us for his ways in the mess if we invite him. God leads me in the mess. And he gives me all of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wants to lead me in my actions, in my reactions, in my emotions, in my needs, and in my relationships. He wants to guide me and give me himself in the middle of the mess. Here's some practical prayers that you can play, pray in messy relationships especially. We want to pray, Jesus be the king. Often it feels like everything else is controlling your life. And we want to say, no, Jesus, you be the king. Again, I would say pray these prayers aloud because you're praying it against the enemy, not just praying to God. Jesus, you be the king in this relationship. You reign. Uh, no darkness, no other person, no other influence controlling this relationship. Jesus, you reign. And then we want to pray, Jesus, stand between me and them. And when I'm praying that, I'm, in, I'm inviting Jesus into the center of the relationship, that nothing else would take that place as the center of that relationship. Jesus, you stand between me and them. And as he does that, he's my bodyguard. He shields me with himself. The Bible talks a lot of times about God as our refuge and our shield and our hiding place. So this is a really biblical prayer. Jesus, stand between me and them. But also, so whatever they throw at me, it comes to Jesus first before it gets to me. But it also means that I'm asking Jesus, I want to look at them through your heart, not just through my own eyes. So Jesus, stand between me and them. And then I want to pray, cover me with the blood of Jesus in this relationship, in this messy situation. Because the blood, and again, prayed aloud, because the blood of Jesus kicks out the enemy. But also we're asking for God's cleansing to keep my heart right with God. And I'm asking him to cleanse me from anything spiritually dark that's, that's come into that relationship. I'm praying for his protection and for his authority with the blood of Jesus. And I'm praying for his healing over me and over them by the blood of Jesus. So I'm praying, cover me with the blood of Jesus in this relationship. And then I want to pray, Holy Spirit, lead. Give me your wisdom and the fruit of the spirit, all of his love and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness. Holy Spirit, fill me and lead me. I want to pray, show me your boundary lines, because we do have to put boundary lines in relationship. And the Bible talks about that. So I want to pray, show me your boundary lines. And I'm asking Jesus to help set limits and appropriate responses. If this happens, this is what I will do. If this happens, this is what I will not do. Uh, if this happens, this is where I will go. I'm asking Jesus to help set limits and appropriate responses for myself and sometimes for my family. These messy situations can put other people uh, in a very vulnerable place. So I want to ask Jesus to help me with that for my whole family. And then I want to pray Jesus, point me to the resources that you have for me. Jesus knows the right people to help. Jesus knows the right help. He knows the right professional people. He knows the right friends. So I want to pray, Jesus, connect me to the resources that you have for me in this situation. Those are just some really practical prayers for very messy relationships and messy situations. But let's go on with the with this account. Genesis 17, then God said, uh, so some more years have passed now, even more years. Um, and, and at this point, it's 14 years since uh, since Ishmael was, was born. I, that just really struck me. I, I knew it was a long time, but that's a long time to wait for God's uh, God's covenant promise. 
and uh, Abraham is saying, but I'm really old and Sarah is really old. And God says, yes, but your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. So he's promising, finally, here comes Isaac, the, 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 the fulfillment of the co covenant. And then Genesis 21, Sarah, Sarah, he's changed her name by now to Sarah, became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore. So there's this fantastic victory in this section. There's all, been all of the mess. And now what's going to happen to the covenant? They tried to fulfill God's plans in their own strength. They made a horrible mess and dragged Hagar into it. What's going to happen to the covenant? And here we see the covenant's fine. God is still able to bring in the covenant despite all of that mess. And so there's a, there's a huge victory in this. Uh, that the mess does not destroy or, or distort the covenant of God. He is able to work despite the mess, and he is able to work through the mess. Uh, he, he has the victory. But here's the next part that happens in Genesis 21. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. He was 14 years old by now, and he was not being very nice about Isaac. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. It's still a pretty messy situation, isn't it? Uh, off she, she has to go again. Uh, in Genesis 21, early in the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, he set them on her shoulders and sent her off with the boy. She wandered. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. This is a desperate situation. So Ishmael is now 14 years old. And I, I had pictured in my mind, uh, you know, Hagar carrying around a baby in this situation. But it's actually a 14-year-old boy. And there she is in the desert. She's completely desperate. There's no way for her to survive in the desert. And it says, when the, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. So we have this next dramatic, dramatic episode in Hagar's story. Now she's been thrown out of the house with her 14-year-old son, and she's stuck in the desert and has no way to survive and all the water is gone and she begins to cry and, and has to lay down her son and walk away. This uh, section of the story really touched me uh, a couple of years ago. I was in a situation with one of my daughters um, where I was heavily involved in, in her care. She was not thriving and was uh, in a very, very dangerous situation. And uh, I came to this passage and said, this is it. This is what I feel like. I feel like we're in the desert and there is no way for, for, for me to sustain her.
absolutely no way for me to sustain that emotionally, physically, spiritually. There's there's nothing left. I can care for her, but I cannot sustain her. I cannot keep her alive. And uh, all, all of us get into those situations. It may be somebody you're caring for who is young. It may be somebody you're caring for who is old. It may be somebody that's just emotionally very dependent on you. Uh, but I had to get to the point where I said, I can't do this. Only you can do this, Jesus. I had to lay her down and just walk, put a little bit of distance between me and her. Um, but look at what this passage promises. Not only does it say that God, uh, th does it show that Hagar began to sob? It says God heard the boy crying. And then again, he tells Hagar, God has heard the boy crying. And in, and in that moment, Lord really spoke to me and said, I hear you and I hear her. And then God opened Hagar's eyes and she saw a well of water. And the Lord said, I want to be your living water. And I want to sustain her. You can't sustain her. I want to be her living water. And I want to sustain her. And that has moved me. It's kind of hard for me to carry on with the talk now. Because it was so powerful the way the Lord met me in that passage. I wonder what pictures this brings up in your mind as you read this. What, the, what are some of the situations in your life? Because that story shows me that Surrender welcomes God himself to sustain in the mess. I simply cannot do it. Hagar had to come to the end of herself. We cannot sustain ourselves or another. We can care for them, we can help them, but we can't sustain them spiritually, emotionally, physically. So she lays down Ishmael and walks away. Let, let's just ask ourselves today a little question. This is a bit of a Maybe a, a little bit deep question and a little bit tricky question. We don't always want to ask, but let's just be brave and ask ourselves a question. What am I, what am I car trying to carry or who am I trying to carry? Who am I trying to heal? Who am I trying to save? What am I trying to fix? What am I trying to control? I need to ask the Lord to help me to get to the point where I say, I can't do it. I need to lay it down in the Father's loving hands, or I need to lay them down in the Father's loving hands. And then I can pray, open my eyes to see that you see me and that you see them. I'm inviting God, El Roy, to be the sustainer. Open my eyes to see that you see me and you see them. That is huge. It's really hard to, 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 to believe that sometimes. And then open my eyes to see your living water in the middle of this desert place. And then I pray, Jesus, come to them. Only Jesus, you, Jesus, can give the living water of the Spirit to them. Not me or my effort or my care. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit as living water. And then I want to pray, sustain me with yourself. Give me your life. I'm surrendering <laughs> all, that, all that I want to do for myself and say, you are the only sustainer. And I want to pray, sustain them with yourself and help them receive your life. This story uh, goes on, but we're going to jump to the New Testament for just a minute because we are people of the new covenant. Not only do we know that God is a covenant making, covenant keeping God, all of his saving power and his love and his faithfulness for us. But in the New Testament, we see that Jesus carries all the mess in the cross and defeats the mess. Not only does God see the mess and God is with us in the mess and God wants to sustain us in the mess, and leaders in the mess, but Jesus has carried it all. And I want to emphasize this: that God is not okay with the mess. He doesn't. He hates to see people suffering. He hates it, and he hates some of the sin 
that is done in relationships and he hates some of the ways that we are treated. But Jesus carries all the mess in the cross and defeats the mess for us. And so the new covenant is for you. Luke 22, verse 19 to 20, is the, the night that Jesus is betrayed and he's having the last supper. And he says, in the, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. His blood has been poured out for us so that we can be God's holy chosen people in the new covenant. He gives himself in love and we can give ourselves to him in love. Uh, the picture uh, on the side of this slide is of a is of a messy cross. Um, and this cross is in is in the cathedral in, in Coventry in England. And um, it's a it's a cross that was made in, in the Second World War. The bombs were dropped on the on the cathedral and many, many people died in, in Coventry that night. And all the roof set on fire and fell down. And when they came the next day, they found these two beams from the burnt out roof laying together as a cross on the floor. And I love this cross. They, they put it up and made an altar with it to raise it up. And I, I, I love this cross because I think it represents for us what Jesus did. He took all the mess into the cross. And think about the mess of war. All the, all the sin, all the evil, all the pain, all the loss, all the grief. Jesus carried it in himself um, in the cross. And Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 says, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Those are no words for sin. Upon Jesus was the chastisement, the punishment, that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Did you read that? He's borne our grief and carried our sorrows in himself at the cross. And he was crushed for all our sin. The punishment that was on him brought us peace. All that mess was laid on him. All the sin that I have ever done. All the sin that has ever been done towards me or my family was laid on Jesus at the cross. He has dealt with the mess at the cross and he has defeated the mess. And then that last part, part says that by his wounds we're healed. I was praying with somebody once and, and God gave them a picture of his wounds as massive, massive wounds covering their wounds. All the wounds of, that my sin has caused, but also all the wounds that other people's sin against me has caused. And sometimes we feel like our wounds are so big, how could God ever heal us? But he covers our wounds with the blood of Jesus, and his wounds are bigger than my wounds. And by his wounds, I can be healed. God gives himself to you in unshakable, unstoppable covenant love through the cross and resurrection. Jesus has suffered for the mess and won for you ultimate victory over the mess for all eternity. So God redeems the mess and gives us his new inheritance in Christ. And remember the story? God had an inheritance for Hagar's son, Ishmael. If there was anybody who was ever a big pile of mess, it was, it was Ishmael. He was born through mess. His very existence wasn't supposed to be. And yet God still had a good inheritance for him. And the enemy comes to us and lies to us and says, you are the mess. That's all you are and all you'll ever be for the past and the present and the future. And I want to say to you today, you are not defined by the mess your mess or the mess of people around you your identity is not the mess or or your response to the mess if you give yourself to jesus completely you are in christ because he's died and risen again for you you are in christ that means you are filled with christ you are covered with christ you are surrounded 
by Christ. That's who you are now. Our inheritance is not the mess. For now or for eternity. Ephesians 1 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be blameless and holy in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood. And then verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. He has adopted you for sonship. That means you have full rights of the son like Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, by his grace, by his blood, he has redeemed your life. And that means you have a new identity and a new inheritance. When my daughters were adopted, uh, we had to hand in their birth certificates, which is a whole story in itself, to the authorities. Um, and the authorities gave them an adoption certificate that had our names on as the parents and gave them their new name. And that is what Jesus Christ has done for us. That's what it means to be in Christ. We have a new identity. And then we had to change our will. We had a will because we were working in Africa. Uh, we had a will and we had to write into our will. Whatever had happened to them in the past had still happened. But now they had a new identity and they had a new inheritance as our children. And that is what Jesus does for us when we are adopted into God's family through Christ. But we need the Holy Spirit, verse 18 says, to open our eyes to see and to know the hope of his glorious inheritance. We need the Holy Spirit to help us receive the inheritance God has for us. And I want to say to you today, whatever you're going through in messy situations, um, that is not your inheritance. Your inheritance is not mess or pain, or grief, or sorrow. Your inheritance is not anxiety, or depression, or despair, or self-loathing. Your inheritance is not broken relationships, or addiction, or destruction, or decay. I just felt like the Lord was asking me to speak that deliberately today. That is not your inheritance. Your inheritance is as a child of God, and an heir with Christ. New heart, by the Holy Spirit, a new identity for now and eternity. You are not the mess. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to receive that new inheritance in Christ. So lastly, if this is who God is, Elroy, the God who sees and the God who hears, then we are carriers of the Spirit of Christ into the messy places. In God's new covenant, we're saved by the blood of Jesus and filled with God's own spirit to carry his love and his truth and his forgiveness and his healing into messy places. So we're set apart as God's holy people, not to avoid the mess, but to carry the presence of Jesus into the messy places. We're to carry the presence of Jesus for him to save and transform in the messy places. And that may be big things or it must just maybe just really small things like staying connected with somebody difficult in your family. Like being connected with the neighbors next door. It doesn't have to be huge, but we are to carry the presence of Jesus Christ into the messy places. And Jesus redeems our mess. Here's some good news. Jesus redeems our mess by working through us to meet others in their mess. I've seen that over and over again. It doesn't have to be that I, they've experienced the same things as me, but just the fact that you've been in some kind of struggle and that you've let God meet you in that struggle means that God can redeem that by you showing his love to others in the middle of their mess. I think of somebody uh, on our Titus team who suffered greatly uh, with a, a grown adult child addicted to drugs 
and has been through terrible trauma with that. And the Lord is redeeming her life and her experience by giving her opportunities to meet with other women who are going through the same thing with their adult addicted children. Uh, we even have a prayer call on a Monday night, uh, especially for those women, and, that, and, and our friend is leading that. If you're interested in that prayer call, addictions are, are some of the hardest things to walk through with your kids. And if you're interested in that care, prayer call, please contact the Titus office. So let's finish. God has called us. Uh, here is this amazing good news. He's El Roy, the God who sees you. He's, he's carried the mess to the cross. He has redeemed the mess. He's defeated the mess. And he's won for you a new inheritance for now and eternity as his own precious daughter, as his own beloved one. And he calls you by name as he called Hagar by name. So he's called us to this kingdom work that we carry the presence of Jesus to the messy places. Will you go? Will you love and pray sacrificially in order to welcome Jesus to redeem the mess and bring his victory for the mess in our communities and in our world? He's asking all of us, will you go? Will you love? Will you pray? Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you today that you are Elroy, the God who sees me. Thank you that you are the God who hears us. And you know the places in our heart where we struggle to believe that and the situations we struggle to believe that for. Lord Jesus, you know. Come, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us in those emotions, in those situations, would you reveal yourself to us today as Elroy? God, we want to praise you that you are for us in the mess. You are with us in the mess. And you are a father of compassion who attentively sits with us in the mess. God, would you help us to believe that? Break every lie of the enemy in Jesus' name. Would you write the distortions in our hearts and minds? distorted images of you, distorted images of us, and distorted images of messes and situations. Spirit of truth, lead us in all truth about you and about us. We praise you, Lord, that you died and rose again to carry the mess and redeem the mess and to defeat the mess. We pray the power of the cross and resurrection over every messy situation in our lives. We pray the blood of Jesus over our hearts and our minds. And Lord, we want to pray that you would uh, speak to us today, open our eyes to see the inheritance that you have won for us as children of, of the Father, beloved daughters and heirs with Christ. Holy Spirit, come, help us to receive our inheritance in you and break any lies that say that our inheritance is the mess or that we are the mess. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you've adopted us into your family. And Lord, we want to pray for those messy situations, that you would come by your Holy Spirit and lead us. Show us when to stay and when to go. Show us what to do and what to say. Guard our hearts and protect us in the messy places. We lay down today anyone or anything that we are trying to control or sustain ourselves. We lay them down and we pray that you will come and sustain us and sustain them. Come with your living water into the middle of our desert places. Jesus, come. So we thank you today for this incredibly good news about you. And we pray that you would meet us and speak it to us. And then that we would carry the Holy Spirit, you, the presence of Christ, all of your love and your attentive care into the messy places of other people. Send us out, Lord, and give us hearts that are willing to obey. In Jesus' name. Amen.